Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Warren. Uh, please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're nearing the end of our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Wilford thought I was done last time, he said, whatever that means. But uh, we're not. We're almost there. Uh, this morning, we're going to read and study verses 7 through 12 of the Sermon on the Mount. One of the aspects of the sermon that uh, endears it to us, and, uh, but also is a strangely challenging one, is the familiarity that we have uh, with the sermon. Uh, many people early in their Christian life read the sermon. And um, so we're familiar. There's the Beatitudes uh, at the start. We all know the, the Beatitudes. And, then Warren mentioned it in his prayer, the Lord's declaration that we should be the light of the world, the, the salt of the earth. There is the admonition uh, to prayer, not in an ostentation, ostentatious way, but rather a retreat to our closet. That's sort of a staple of, of Christianity, of the church, that we have a prayer closet, a place that we go for a, a quiet time. There's the Lord's Prayer, uh, our Lord's instruction to us on how we ought to pray. The admonition to store up our treasures in heaven and not on earth. The admonition not to worry, but rather to seek first our Father's kingdom and His righteousness. And in our last lesson, uh, the opening verses of chapter 7 of Matthew, we enjoyed that very familiar illustration of the speck in our brother's eye and the beam in our own. Well, today we have two more. Uh, the triad of prayer. Ask, seek, knock. And we'll find that our prayers are effective. And the golden rule. Who doesn't know the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. I'm going to suggest today that combined, these two exhortations form a kind of capstone to the sermon serving to sum up its desperate, disparate parts. But when we come to the seventh verse of chapter seven, as we are this morning, we've just left the Lord's warning against censorious judgment, coupled with his demand alternatively that we engage in discriminating judgment, don't throw, don't cast our pearls before swine. And now he issues three direct commands in regard again to prayer. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. So we have a different translation, treat people the way you want them to treat you instead of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, that last little clause, I want you to note, uh, for this is the law and the prophets, uh, marks this off as what students of literature and usage call an inclusio. Uh, we shouldn't just shrug that off because it sounds very technical, but it simply refers to an intentional device an author can utilize to bring a body of material back to where it started, for if you look back at chapter 5 and verse 17, you'll remember that the Lord announced he had not come to abolish the law and the prophets. Not to abolish, he said, but to fulfill it. And what 
what has followed since has been largely an expansion on that thought. His kingdom and the behavior of the citizens of his kingdom should reflect everything the law and the prophets was about. And now, verse 12 of chapter 7 brings us a full circle uh, back to the headline, we might say. And that's one reason why I called this section a capstone uh, to the sermon. I met with some men this week, five of us. Uh, we've known each other, all of us, for, for many years, and we've recently determined uh, to meet for lunch once a month, uh, just to enjoy each other's company, uh, but also to encourage one another in our faith. And we decided to choose one verse as sort of a touching point uh, each month uh, to, to talk about spiritual things, to talk about uh, the Lord, so that the lunches don't just degenerate as they tend to do into old stories and jokes and, and laughs. And I got to choose the first one, and I chose the very first verse of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, verse 3 of chapter 5, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why did Jesus uh, begin his sermon with that? Well, it was because, and you know this, it is the first fundamental factor in living the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ, understanding our total spiritual bankruptcy apart from God's enabling grace. Nothing in my hand I bring, when we studied it, I quoted from that hymn, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, lest I die. Well, the first beatitude seems to me to be the foundation upon which all the rest relies. We cannot meet the demands of the sermon on our own because on our own we are helpless. Uh, the remainder of the beatitudes uh, reinforce that first one. We mourn over our sin. Uh, we are meek and understand that we're undeserving of others' accolades, of their praise. We hunger and thirst for righteousness because we know we don't have any uh, in and of ourselves. And, and, and so on, really, uh, throughout all the following verses, he starts with poverty of spirit, but then Jesus gives us a hefty list of things that should characterize us as Christians. He sets a high standard and it would be easy to despair of our frequent failure to align our conduct with his precepts and meet his high demands. So it's not unusual at all that the Lord would now offer up for the second time prayer as the natural and essential activity of the believer. Uh, Calvin, in one of his sermons, wrote, the principal exercise which the children of God have is to pray. For in this way, they give a true proof of their faith. And so, uh, though this seventh verse may appear to be an abrupt change of thought, it is not at all. You know how with most preachers, we have one sitting in here with us this morning, you know how with most preachers, you can I often identify when they begin the transition to the conclusion of uh, their sermon. Uh, uh, that's when you very quietly close your Bible up. It's, it's, almost, it's almost over. Well, this is the Lord's. It is a command to persistent prayer. Prayer is the natural activity of the true believer and a corrective to the disillusionment that so frequently tempts us. And his words here offer us important elements of effective prayer. Let me name a couple. First, there ought to be a trusting persistence to them. Uh, notice these are present imperatives in verse 7. 
interpreters often embellish the sense of them by translating them, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on doing all these things, because the one who keeps on asking is given what they ask for, and the one who keeps on seeking finds, and the one who keeps on knocking finds the door open. And what is not explicitly stated is that the one who despairs of asking when, when the prayer remains unanswered or the answer is not the one desired or it seems if, as if God has turned a deaf ear to his request and, and then gives up seeking the object of his prayer. Such a person betrays the, the quality or even the reality of his faith, like, like in the parable of the seed and the so sower. Such behavior may mark him out as one in whom the seed of the gospel has fallen under rocky soil without depth. And once he has encountered the difficulties of life and become frustrated with the lack of a, a quick fix, his professed faith withers and dies. And so note also a second element of effective prayer found in Jesus' words. He calls for an increasing urgency in them. Uh, there seems to be pictured an ascending sc scale of intensity. Uh, one of the commentators suggested the illuminating picture of a child who, uh, if his mother is near and visible, ask. Uh, if she's neither near or visible, he seeks. And if she has locked herself in her room, he knocks. The child knows that once his mother is in range of his request, it will be lovingly heard, for he has learned that to be her unfailing response. Well, Jesus wants the same boldness to characterize you and me. We, we can imagine, not just imagine, but convincingly know that there are all sorts of reasons why our majestic and holy God might deny what we ask and what we seek and what we plead for, but still he would have us not waver in asking, but persist. I think it was just a few Sundays ago that Dan reminded us of the illustration from George Mueller's life of how he prayed diligently for years for the spiritual condition of two of his friends. You've heard this illustration before, and he did not despair, and he would not stop, but he continued to pray for them. And right before Mueller died, one of his friends uh, came to faith, and shortly after he died, the other one came to faith. Well, we like to hear stories like that because they encourage us in our own prayers, but it's when the rubber meets the road and, and we have our own burdens that seem to meet with only the silence of God that we are tempted. Now see, I can stand here and look out among you and there's not a single one of you that don't know what I'm talking about. Everyone does. God is not answering our prayers. And we're tempted, tempted to give up, uh, tempted to conclude that we're praying out of God's will, tempted to be bitter or think that we are getting only what we deserve because of our sin. For me, one of the more intriguing passages of Scripture is the one in 2 Corinthians 12 in which the Apostle Paul reveals his thorn in the flesh which he says God gave him to keep him from exalting himself. We all want that, right? Some thorn in the flesh so we won't exalt ourselves. But <clears throat> he wrote there that concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might lead me. You know, so perhaps Paul asked, and, and then he saw it, and then he knocked. Uh, we don't know for sure, but we're to understand that Paul ceased in, in that prayer. But he gives the reason he ceased. God revealed to Paul the purpose of his thorn in the flesh. It was actually given to him, this thorn was. God spoke to him, saying, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Well, I think if God speaks 
to one of us like that in regard to an issue that we have been praying about, then we have allowance to do as Paul did and move on from that request. But absent that, the Lord Jesus Christ here is urging upon us, not surrender, but increasing fervency and confidence in our prayers, knowing that that is his, his will for us to, no matter what transpires in the process, to keep on pressing the Lord in prayer. I wish I could pay better attention to my own lesson here because I'm achingly familiar with the frustration of what appears to be unanswered prayer. I remember Dr. Johnson one time I think it was in the classroom, uh, speaking about some scriptural mandate of behavior, saying, I'm not really very good at this, but I sure can preach it. You can hear him saying that. Well, I'm not good at it. I'm not sure I can teach it either, but uh, that's, that's the lesson. But we ought not to overlook the simplicity offered here in Jesus' command, ask. You know, we're typically very good at that, asking. Uh, But when we lack something that we are convinced that we need, perhaps it's our daily bread or health, but it may be victory over a shortcoming more spiritual in nature, like patience or contentment or vanity or our love of the world or love of the approval of men, and we are convinced we lack some good thing, then we should ask. James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. Can you imagine all that we're missing out on because we're not asking? We may not be literally blaming God for what we perceive as a lack of blessing, but to the degree that we're frustrated or disappointed or confounded over the lack of joy in our life or growth in our faith or contentment in our circumstances, the fault does not lie with God, but with our own unwillingness to turn to Him and ask Him. I have been impressed uh, recently more than ever uh, with how often I've spoken with members of our church who've been confronted with great difficulties in their lives and who, when told that many others have been praying for them, have with great assurance responded that they have felt the power of those prayers. I know many of you are mighty prayer warriors for the various ministries here uh, at, that we endeavor upon at, at our church. It's not just the elders and deacons who are, are praying, but so many of our body are fervent in prayer for the church. So what is it we're lacking? Uh, what does the future hold for us? What concerns do we have about that? What will be uh, the consequences of, of this now almost year-long pandemic that has altered so much of what we do and and how we do it. Well, we must take those concerns to the Lord. Uh, That that may sound try, take take it to the Lord, but uh, he does himself, you know, have an interest in what we're doing here. Uh, He's not sitting off in heaven aloof. He's very much interested in this moment and this week and this month and this year of what's going on at Believer's Chapel. In the lives of Christ's disciples, true commitment perseveres. Perseveres in action and conduct and perseveres in prayer. No one, Jesus said in Luke 9, verse 62, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, we are not of those who look back, but of those who look forward in faith to the promises God has yet to fulfill. Prayer works. That may sound like a utilitarian thing to say, prayer works. 
It's actually the promise of our Lord in the eighth verse of the passage. Look there. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Now the key to this uh, comes out forcefully in the verses following uh, that feature the disposition of our Father in heaven toward his children. So that should form the background, even though it comes later, of, of verse 8. We are the children of a God who is good to his children. And the point of the verse is not really some repeated slogan that persistence wins out in the end, as if we're in a, some seminar our company has put on for us, uh, but that our Heavenly Father, who loves His children, will certainly answer their prayer. Now, you'll note that each action commanded, ask, seek, knock, is, is promised a positive response. And the promise is universal and timeless. That means that today, every one of us who asks, receives. And every one of us who seeks, finds. And to every one of us who knocks, our Father responds. He opens in response. Faithful, persistent prayer is effective. It's the means God uses to allow us a firsthand experience of how He exercises His will through the means of the prayers of the saints. It may seem counterintuitive uh, to those of us who believe so strongly in the sovereignty of God and we consider ourselves uh, Calvinists, uh, but pick up uh, Calvin's Institutes and go, if you have that two-volume McNeil uh, version, uh, go to the second volume and open up to the very beginning in chapter 20, and here you'll read Calvin explaining how God ordains even the prayers he calls forth from his saints. God ordained prayer, he writes, not just for his sake, but for ours. And then he numbers the reasons that this is so. Listen, first, that our hearts may be fired with jealous and burning desire to seek, love, and serve him while we become accustomed in every need to flee to him as to a sacred anchor. Secondly, that there may enter our hearts no desire at all of which we should be ashamed to make him a witness while we learn to set all our wishes before his eyes. Thirdly, that we be prepared to receive his benefits with true gratitude of heart and thanksgiving, benefits that our prayer reminds us come from his hand. Fourthly, that having obtained what we were seeking, we should be led to meditate upon his kindness. And finally, and I'm skipping some here, uh, but finally, that use and experience may confirm his providence. While we understand not only that he promises never to fail us, but also that he ever extends his hand to help his own, not wet nursing them with words, but defending them with present help. Our Lord would have us to learn, and this is me now, not, not Calvin, sorry, but our, our Lord would have us to learn that not only must we learn to pray in all circumstances, but also that they are the means God uses to pour out his blessings of answers to our prayers as we persist in them. It's no wonder uh, the Lord twice offered parables in his, to his disciples that illustrated the effectiveness of importunate prayer. First in Luke 11, in which a man has a guest he needs to feed. So he goes to a neighbor. Well, they've already gone to bed, and so his neighbor refuses, yet he persists. And Jesus says it is his persistence that causes his neighbor to give him what he needed. And then in Luke 18, uh, he tells the parable of a widow, the importunate widow who kept going to an unjust judge to ask for protection from someone trying to take advantage of her. 
And the judge, remember, refuses for a while, but because of the widow's, as the judge put it, bothering him, he acceded to her request. Persistence in prayer is a thing the Lord loved to emphasize. We are to take our needs before him and persist, persist in asking his favor. You caught me preaching to myself there. We, we are to take our request to him and persist in seeking his favor. And, and that brings us uh, to the second reason for the poor in spirit to cope with their trials and difficulties, difficulties in this way. It is in the nature of our loving Heavenly Father to hear our prayers and to respond in loving accordance with that nature. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence that we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked from him. And Paul expressed much the same thing when he wrote in Philippians 4, 19, that my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And here we have the testimony of Jesus himself to the nature of our Father in heaven. He, he compares him to a typical earthly father, verse 9. Uh, what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you, you know, apparently bread back then uh, might look like a stone. I, I don't know. But uh, even an earthly father won't give a stone to a, a child, flesh and blood, who asks for, for bread or, or give a snake if he asks for a fish. If you then, verse 11, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? How are we to understand this? Well, it's very simple. First, we start with the basics. Uh, we fathers are all evil people. That's, that's the most basic thing. It, it uh, sounds terrible to say, it pains me to say it, but we know what the Lord meant. We're tainted by sin. Uh, sin touches every fiber of my being, e even my efforts at, at good intentions. But by God's grace, even earthly fathers in their sin may be moved to respond in a good way to their children when they ask for something. You know, the horrible things that we read about in the newspaper where some father has, has terribly abused his own child. These are the outliers, generally, generally speaking. Uh, even what we would call a bad father uh, would not go out of his way to return a snake instead of a fish when requested by his own flesh and blood. He may be absent, he may be selfish, he may be mean and a, and a drunkard, but when his own child asks him for some good thing, by common grace, again, most would find no tendency to return to that child an unsatisfying or harmful thing. So the Lord's argument is, again, as in a previous section, a fortiori. It's, it's an argument from the lesser to the greater. If earthly fathers, being evil, know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more will our heavenly Father give what is good to those who ask Him? And saying that, it's not a bad time uh, in our lesson to note the obvious. John said it, if we ask anything according to His will, he hears us. The Lord is not a magic genie. I came up with that thought myself. I found it later in one of the commentators, but he's no genie. We're rubbing that lamp, and uh, nothing happens like it did in the storybooks when we were children. Nothing happens. 
That's because sometimes our requests are against the Lord's will, either his preceptive will or, or his decretive will. Uh, you may passionately pray that the Lord will make you a multimillionaire, but when it doesn't happen, there's a good chance it's because it was neither his preceptive nor his decretive will. And that he has not answered that prayer of yours is likely the most loving thing he could do for you, seeing as how you've asked for it passionately. He's saving you from your own consequences. He loves you, and he is gracious and good to those who are his children, his spiritual children. And so we come uh, to verse 12. It's rightly known as the golden rule, a maxim so pure and simple, and yet so proud, so profound it is, as the saying goes, worth its weight in gold. When you study uh, the Bible, you always want to pay attention to the flow of the argument. It's not always easy. But you want to pay attention to the flow of the argument and therefore to little words that, that serve as keys to that flow, such as the therefore we see here in uh, verse 12. It actually is a, a very small word in the Greek, un. We transliterate that O-U-N, un. Perhaps it would be better then to translate it with a, another small word, so. So. In everything, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. But there's no obvious connection to the verses just before, which we've been studying. Followers of Jesus should cope with their frustrations in adhering to the ethical demands of the Sermon on the Mount and to all the various needs they encounter in life by persistent prayer. So do unto others as they have you do unto them? No. Uh, it must be that the Lord intended his words to be a fitting capstone to the entire sermon. He said, we said that at the beginning. This is the law and the prophets. It's the second half of the inclusio following after verse 17 of chapter 5. Almost every commentator on the sermon <clears throat> mentions how Jesus' admonition <coughs> excuse me, differs from similar admonitions found in other literature. <clears throat> the moral idea of considering how you yourself would feel or react to your own actions or behavior should they be expressed in reverse is one that's been pondered by others. Confucius, for example, said, do not to others what you would not wish done to yourself. The Stoics <clears throat> had a similar saying. And the Old Testament Apocrypha contains this, do not do to anyone what you yourself would hate. The famous Rabbi Hillel, who is well known in, in Jesus, day supposedly said, what is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. This is the whole law. The rest is only commentary. Well, the obvious difference between these utterances, pay attention, the, only, the obvious difference between these utterances and what Jesus said is that they're all fashioned in the negative sense of what one ought not do, while Jesus' rule is in the positive. It obliges the hearer to positively do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, is that difference uh, significant? I think it is somewhat. Well, it may be difficult not to gossip about someone or to refrain from stealing 
from another something that you covet yourself or to resist putting a banana peel in front of someone that you don't like. Still, you're only being asked in such cases to abstain from certain actions because you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end yourself. But Jesus' positive form calls for an active fulfillment. It pulls us out of pietistic retreat or even stoic self-righteousness into the world of the needy and the lost, asking us to think about what we would want others to do for us were we in a like position. The Lord calls us to engagement in the context of the real world around us where struggles are taking place and enemies are threatening and real people are facing dire straits with no one else perhaps there for them except you, the one Jesus is calling to treat them in the kind of way that you, where you in the same dire straits would desperately want them to treat you. And that calls for more than declining to do evil. It calls for compassion and sacrifice. It asks us to rise up out of our self-interest and take up the Lord's battles and the Lord's mission and act for Him on behalf of others. This is the law and the prophets, he concludes. In one sentence, in other words, he summarizes it all. In another place, uh, chapter 22 of Matthew, verse 40, Jesus says that the whole law and the prophets depend on the two commandments, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Both call us to deny ourselves and surrender instead to love and care for others, and especially to a whole dedication to our Savior. There's no temptation so powerful as self-love. No force so pernicious, uh, no lust so captivating. And the sermon calls us to abandon that and devote ourselves to God's kingdom. And for that we need His grace. He eagerly awaits our petitions. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Well, let's pray God's grace to help us in that. We do, Lord, bow humbly before you, uh, confessing our failures, confessing our impatience, confessing our resentment, uh, confessing our dis unbelief, um, confessing how we give up and take matters into our own hands. And so, Lord, we pray your grace. We ask for it. Uh, we seek after it. Uh, we uh, knock and pray that you give us the grace and the ministry of the Spirit to persist in it. And, Lord, we pray that you would uh, make us the type of followers of Christ who would uh, really positively seek out uh, to treat others in the ways that we would like to be treated. That is a very Christ-like thing, and we need your help and your grace. For Jesus' sake, amen.